Good afternoon. Please take your seats. My name is Doug. I'm a congressional associate at the Aspen Institute, and uh, I'm here to introduce this wonderful panel with John Lewis uh, about civil rights on the march. Congressman Lewis is a congressman from Georgia and a civil rights legend, and he'll be being interviewed about his graphic novel March and his experiences in civil rights by Gwen Eiffel, co-anchor of the PBS NewsHour. Thank you. Thank you. I like the introduction, short and sweet. That's thank you very much. You know, just a few minutes ago, I don't know how many of you were in the room when the students were here for the Aspen Challenge, and there was something one of them said that completely, perfectly sets out the conversation we're about to have here with our living legend. She said, taking, she, she said what she learned from the Aspen Challenge was taking chances even when it's absolutely terrifying. Sitting next to me, is a gentleman who took chances at the age, at the age of 23 he spoke at the March on Washington, was the youngest speaker. He took chances in leading SNCC across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He took chances most of us dream about. And now all these years later he still takes chances because he shows up at Congress every single day <laughs> with great, great plans. And now he took another chance, which is really interesting. He decided, someone approached him to tell his story. Again, he's written his own books, he's told this, but this time, he's reaching in a completely new audience with a graphic novel. Now, I don't know if all of you know what graphic novels are, but what's interesting about them, it's his story, but it's told in black and white cartoon pictures. Now, what's interesting about a, a graphic novel is it reaches in a completely different audience. I'm gonna ask him in a moment how he came to be doing this, because this is an interesting way to tell the story, but first, I wanna welcome you, John well, Lewis. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted and honored uh, to be interviewed by you. Every time I'm in his presence, I get a little, you know. <laughs> he knows this. And if I forget to tell you this um, later, there's a book signing right outside afterward, and he'll be signing any books you want to purchase and give to all your loved ones. Okay, I want to start by talking about this unusual way. A lot of people think they know your story. They think that they know the story of the civil rights movement. In fact, today is the 50th anniversary, anniversary of the signing of the, of the Civil Rights Act. But we are at... But we're in the midst of a bunch of anniversaries. Last year was the March on Washington, earlier this year was Brown v. Board, next year will be the Voting Rights Act. We've been going through all of this. The question is, do you feel a little anniversaried out? Uh, no, I, I really don't, but I know I'm getting a little older. And um, I was 23 at the March on Washington. Yeah. I was only 21 during the Freedom Rides, 20 during the sit-ins. But I still feel very young, and I'm ready to march and to continue to march and march again. Yeah. That's an anniversary I forgot. Freedom Summer, this summer, 50 years ago. Now, the inter inter interesting thing to me about Freedom Summer is young people were the ones who got on those buses and came from college houses all, of, all over the country, and they moved to Mississippi to register people to vote. And they took a lot of chances. And as we know, some were murdered and some were, there was violence. Uh, and now here you're finding a way to reach out to young people again. Was that what you found appealing about this approach? Well, I, I must tell you, a, a staffer of mine, back in 1980, was it 86? Or maybe later, came, came to he's me. He's sitting here, Andrew uh, Iron, uh, by the way, which is uh, why he's checking the, the dates. Well, this young man, I think he was only about 24 then, came to me and said, uh, why don't you write a, a, a comic book? That's what he called it. A comic book. Right. It was the end of one of my campaigns. And why don't you write a comic book? And I said, no, <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. And then it reminded me that in 1958, when I was only 18 years old, there was another book, comic book called Martin Luther King Jr. and the Montgomery Story. Huh. It was 14 pages and it sold for 10 cents. It was published by the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Hmm. And he kept coming back and I kept saying, well, maybe. And I finally said, yes, if you would do it with me. So here's my co-writer, my co-author. So how did you find, go about then finding someone to do the actual comics, the actual drawings? which are so compelling, well, especially we, the black and white. We uh, got a publishing company called uh, Top Chef, 
And with that help and support, uh, we got an illustrator. Mm -hmm. uh, His name is Nate Powell. Nate Powell, well known in the comic world. Uh, three Southerners coming together, uh, writing and drawing and telling the story, telling my story. And it's been just a wonderful experience. And we, we got book one out, it's gonna be book two, it's gonna be book three, and hundreds and thousands of children, young people, and those not so young are reading the book. This is what I find interesting. This is book one, and there are three, gonna be three. The, the second one is coming out in January in anticipation of the anniversary of the Selma March. And one of the things I'm curious about this is why, which, why you chose to tell this early part of your story. A lot of people think they know your history. Well, I want, I, I, I want the young people, and people not so young, those that was not even a dream, not even born, to know that I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But when we were visited, the little town of Troy, a visit Montgomery, a visit Tuskegee, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. And I didn't like it. Hmm. And I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents why. And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. Hmm. And in 1955, 15 years old, in the 10th grade, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on the old radio. And it seemed like Dr. King was saying, John Robert Lewis, you too can do something. Really? And I wanted to do something. And I was so inspired that in 1956, at the age of 16, with some of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we went down to the public library in the little town of Troy, Alabama, trying to get a library card, trying to check out some books. And we were told by the librarian that the libraries were whites only and not for color. Hmm. I never went back to the library, this particular library, until July 5th. 1998 for a book signing of my first book, wow. Walking with the Wind. <laughs> and hundreds of blacks and white citizens showed up and I made a little speech. I signed a lot of books. At the end of the book signing, they gave me a library card. <laughs> so it took me a long time to get a library card from that library. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the chickens. Well, growing up down the farm, uh, my father, who had been a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But in 1944, when I was four, four years old, I remember when I was four. Most of us, you know, cannot go that far back. But yeah. I remember when I was four. He had bought this land, and we still own the land today. On this farm, we raised a lot of cotton and peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. It was my responsibility to care for the chickens. And I fell in love with raising chickens like no one else could raise chicken. <laughs> I won't bore you with the story, but we- I'm well, not bored. <laughs> well, we, we, I tell the story in, in this little book, yeah. Walk, um, March, book one. When the setting here was set, you take the fresh eggs and you mark them with a pencil. You place them under the setting hen and you wait three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. And the reason you will mark the fresh egg with a pencil from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest and there would be some more eggs. Had to be able to the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting hen. Do you follow me? I, I didn't have to do this in my growing up, but I'm following you, yes. You, you follow me, okay. So when the little chicks were hatched, I would take these little chicks and give them to another hen. Uh -huh. uh, put them in a box with a lantern. Uh -huh. Raise them on their own, get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, carry to set here in the stone and nest for another three weeks. I kept on fooling and cheating on these setting hens. And when I look back on it, it was not the right thing to do. No. It, it was not the moral thing to do. <laughs> no. It was not the most loving thing to do. It's not the most nonviolent thing to do. It was not the most democratic thing to do. All these things you learned later. Well, later. But uh, <laughs> we used to get the Susan Robert catalog. Do you know that big, thick book? The the Sears book. a Roebuck catalog? Right. Yeah. Some people call it an ordinary book. Mm -hmm. Other people call it the Wish book. I wish I had this. I wish I had right. that. So I was never quite able to save $18.98. So I just kept on cheating on this. When I was about eight or nine years old, I wanted to be a minister. Mm -hmm. I wanted to preach the gospel. So from time to time, with the help of my brothers and sisters and my cousins, 
We would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard, like all of these people gather here. <laughs> and the chickens, along with my brother and sisters, would help make up the audience, the congregation. <laughs> and I would start speaking, or preaching, and when I look back on it, some of these chickens would bite their heads. Some of these chickens would shake their heads. <laughs> they never quite said amen. <laughs> But I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me in the day in the Congress. <laughs> As a matter of fact, some of those chickens were just a little more productive. <laughs> At least they produce eggs. That's enough for that. If you go to the congressman's office in Washington, it's like a civil rights museum, but he also has some, some of those chickens on display. Yeah, I have a collection of chickens there to remind <laughs> me yeah. of, of those days. Tell me, this, the interesting thing about this book or this approach to me is that you're speaking kind of from a child's eye view. You're telling the story, your, a story of yourself as a child, but you're also speaking in a way. Is, does, that, does that minimize or enhance the history? Well, I think it enhances the history. It tends to demonstrate uh, an innocent child growing up very, very poor in rural Alabama, but at the same time being inspired by a Martin Luther King Jr., a Rosa Parks. I met Rosa Parks when I was 17 in 1957. Hmm. I met Martin Luther King Jr. in 1958. Meeting these two individuals inspired me. Uh, when I finished high school in 1957, I wanted to attend a little college called Troy State College. It's now known as Troy University. Hmm. Submitted my application, my high school transcript. I never heard a word from the school. So I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I didn't tell my mother, my father, any of my sisters or brothers, any of my teachers. I told him I needed his help. I wanted to attend Troy State. Dr. King wrote me back. He did. He wrote me back wow. and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket and invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. In the meantime, I was accepted at a little college in Nashville, Tennessee, a little Baptist college, American Baptist College. An uncle of mine in September 1957 gave me a $100 bill, more money than I ever had, gave me one of these big trunks, a foot locker. I put everything that I own, my few books, my clothing, everything except those chickens, and took a <laughs> Greyhound bus to Nashville. And after being in Nashville for about three weeks, I told one of my teachers that I'd been in contact with Dr. King. He informed Dr. King that I was in Nashville. Martin Luther King Jr. got back in church and suggested when I was home for spring break to come and see him. What did Dr. King see in you, do you think? Well, I think he saw something. Who This unusual kid from rural Alabama wanting to attempt to go to Troy State. Um, maybe he saw courage or uh, saw somebody with just a little maybe maladjusted or something. <laughs> did you feel yeah. courageous though at the time? Because sometimes I think of the things you did at an age when most people are not thinking this courageously. And I wonder if the time you, you knew what you were getting into. Well, I didn't like segregation. I didn't like racial discrimination. I, I didn't like being bussed in an old broken down school bus passing the white schools. I didn't like having a hand-me-down books. And I wanted to get education. I wanted to do better. But the difference between not liking something and doing something about it, these students we just saw here a few minutes ago don't like things and they're doing something about it. What is it that motivates someone, especially at such a young age, to be engaged rather than to say, as your parents said to you, that's just the way it is? Well, Dr. King was saying something else. Mm. Rosa Parks was saying something else, that you too can change things. And by being, the discussion I had with Dr. King that day, just walking into that church meeting, seeing him, he said, well, you're the boy from Troy. <laughs> well, you're John Lewis. <laughs> and I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. I gave my whole name. <laughs> and to be in his presence, <laughs> to be able to, to talk with him, it, was, it, was, it just made me feel so stronger and daring. And he said, you know, if you pursue going to Troy State College, now known as Troy University, we may have to file a lawsuit. Uh, your parents' home could be bombed or burned. Mm. And it's going to be very dangerous. 
So I went back and had a discussion with my mother and my father. They were so frightened. Of course. So I continued to study in Nashville. So it was in Nashville that I started attending nonviolent workshops conducted by a young man by the name of Jim Lawson. We studied the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence. We studied what Gandhi attempted to do in South Africa, what he attempted to accomplish. We studied the role in civil disobedience. We said it for Dr. King and Rosa Parks and the people in Montgomery was all about. You know, what I find interesting in this past series, the season of anniversaries, is uh, the folks I've interviewed, uh, talked to Robert Moses, who, who organized Freedom Summer, and you all have an uncanny ability to remember names, dates, and times. Is it because of the times that you lived in? You can tell me exactly what date it was that you met Martin Luther King. You can name the name of activists who most of us have never heard of. And that, to me, is very affecting, that you still hold this history right in the front of your brain like that? Well, we became a circle of trust, a band of brothers and sisters. You don't forget the faces, the names, the places, the date. Um, I remember, I remember when we left on the Freedom Ride. I remember my first trip to Washington, D.C. to leave to go on the Freedom Rides in 1961, mm -hmm. the same year that President Barack Obama was born. And I think a lot of young people growing up today they don't think about it, that in 1961, black people and white people couldn't board a Greyhound bus, a trailway bus in Washington, D.C., seated together to travel through Virginia, through North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, on our way to New Orleans. I remember so well the meal and what I ate the night before we left. You know, when growing up in rural Alabama, going to school in Nashville, and this book will tell you, I never been to a Chinese restaurant before. Never had Chinese food. But the night of May 3rd, 1961. See what I mean about the dates? Mm -hmm. uh, the group of us, the 13 Freedom Riders, seven whites, hmm. six African American, went to a Chinese restaurant. It was a wonderful meal. <laughs> they had the silver dishes and the cover <laughs> dishes, the laser Susan, you know. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And someone that night said, you should eat well, because this may be like the Last Supper. Oh. And the next day, May 4th, some boarded a Greyhound bus and some boarded a trailway bus. Were you thinking back now on that time, which it's so easy to call it heroic now, but thinking back on that time, did you, do you think that you were, had stars in your eyes a little bit? the idea that you were gonna go there and just change the way things had always been, or that you, or that you anticipated the kind of violence that you actually encountered? Well, I had gone through the sit-ins as a student in Nashville. And so I got it was a, training, right? It was training, and we were prepared um, to accept nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. So if someone would spit on us, we wouldn't strike back. If someone pull hot water, hot coffee, hot chocolate, pull us off the lunch counter stool, we would just sit there and look straight ahead. And not in t-shirts and jeans, you were dressed. We dress, we dress. As a matter of fact, I tell you, uh, I, I'd, go, I'd gone in and sat in, but m most time I wore a tie and a suit. We heard that we were gonna be arrested on February the 27th, 1960, and I wanted a good suit to wear. I wanted, I wanted to be sharp. You got a good seat, suit to be arrested in? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And so I didn't have enough money to buy a new suit, so I went downtown Nashville to a used men's store. And I bought a suit, Barton 500. And the suit only cost $5. I wish I still had a suit today. <laughs> Botany 500, I remember those suits. Yeah, and um, uh, Andrew Iden, and my, uh, co-writer was doing some research, and he came up with a, a photograph of me being arrested, wearing that suit. Really? Yeah. You're I, I wish I still had that suit. <laughs> I'm sure it would fit exactly the same. I'm not so sure about yeah. that. Yeah. You are 74. I'm 74. 74, mm -hmm. years young. Uh, what was it like to go to Comic Con? Oh, going to Comic Con, uh, I, I, I've never seen anything like it. You didn't it. know where I was going with that, did you? I, 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 it was fun, it was a lot of fun, but I'm going back. You are? I, I'm going back for the 50th anniversary of the march from Selma to Montgomery and for the uh, publishing of uh, 
book two. I, 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 read, I, read that, and I read on NPR that the line for in your book signing included, you know, people dressed in huge costumes at Comic-Con. Three Doctor Whos, four Wolverines, and one Transformer. Well, I'm going back. Really? And I'm going to wear my backpack that I wore across the bridge. Really? Uh, it won't be the same backpack, but, but, I'm, yeah. but I'm going to have a backpack, my trench coat, that are similar to the trench coat I had. I'm going to dress like John Lewis. Mm. And um, you almost killed in that march. Well, it was Bloody Sunday, March 7, 1965, about 3 p.m. I will never forget it. There were 600 of us walking in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. We were on a sidewalk crossing the bridge. We got to the edge of the bridge. We saw a line of Alabama state troopers. And behind the state troopers, the sheriff posse was on horseback. A man identified himself and sent a Major John Cloud of the Alabama state troopers. This is an unlawful march. It would not be allowed to continue. I give you three minutes to disperse, return to your homes or to your church. And a young man walking beside me from Dr. King's organization by the name of Jose Williams mm. said, Major, give us a moment to kneel and pray. Mm. And the Major said, Troopers advance. Wow. And you saw these guys put in on their gas masks. They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks, tramping us with horses, and releasing the tear gas. I was the first one to be hit. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. And I had a concussion at the bridge. My legs went from under me. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. But I do recall being back at the church. I don't know how I made it across. Yeah, I guess get? someone carried me. Yeah. But I, I got back to the church, and someone said, say something to the audience. Speak up, John. Speak. The church was full to capacity. More than 2,000 people on outside trying to get in. And I said, I don't understand it. How President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam and cannot send troops to Selma, Alabama to protect people who only desire to register to vote. And the next thing I knew, I had been admitted to the Good Samaritan Hospital in Selma, Alabama, where a group of nuns took care of us, the Sisters of St. Joseph. Mm. Hadn't been for these nuns and for a lot of other people, I'm not so sure we would have survived. I'm, I'm very curious as we look at this year of looking back, these years of looking back, one of, the, one of the things that's emerged has been kind of a retelling of the story from the point of view of Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, and the degree to which he, for instance, there's this play on Broadway all the way in which yes, he, yes, have you seen uh, it? Yes. And? I, I was very moved by it. It yeah. was, you know, in theater and movies, you take a little liberty here and there. They took a lot of liberty, actually. Yeah, but, uh, but, I mean, it was good play. It, it, it was very good. Yeah. It, it was very, very good. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, he was determined. But he, he also, he was determined to, to help, but not always. I mean, he, no. was, he was often an obstacle. Well, in, in 1964, after Dr. King had received a Nobel Peace Prize and came back to Washington and had a meeting with President Johnson, he said, uh, uh, Mr. President, we need a voter rank site. And, and President Johnson said in so many words, Dr. King, I just signed a civil rank site. We don't have the votes in the Congress to get the voter rank site. He said, in effect, make me do it. Hmm. And we did. In Selma, Alabama in 1965, people could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. People were asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap, the number of jelly beans in a jar. There were black lawyers and doctors and college professors High school principals and teachers, farmers and housewives were told they could not read it or write well enough. So we had to press the issue. People stood in unmovable line. We went to Selma in 1962. Mm -hmm. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had been working there. And then in Mississippi in 61, 63, 64. You talk about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. There was not always agreement, even within the movement. Uh, about what the right approach was? Well, some people thought we should just engage in direct action. Right. Others thought we should uh, 
go out and try to get people involved in the political process by trying to get people registered to vote. And that's what the Mississippi Summer Project was all about. Right. That's what Selma was all about. And that's what Fannie Lou Hamer was all about. That's what, when she testified at the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City in August 1964. I don't know how many of you got a chance to see the PBS American Experience documentary last week, but if you can't, can go look online called Freedom Summer, in which they play extended clips of Fannie Lou Hamer testifying before Congress that summer, I mean before the, the American Convention, and it was remarkable. There was just, Lyndon Johnson had to rush to the White House and have a press conference to try to take the cameras away from her. Yeah, to get her off the air. Right. Well, on the other hand, because of the march from Selma to Montgomery, because of the drama, mm -hmm. because of what happened, the American people couldn't take it. They couldn't stand it. So there was a sense of righteous indignation. Mm -hmm. And eight days later, President Johnson delivered one of the most moving speeches on voting rights and civil rights. We call it the We Shall Overcome speech, March 15, 1965. Do you sometimes think Robert Moses talked about, the, actually, the cartoon civil rights movement. He wasn't talking about this. But he's talking about the notion that there were only a few heroes, that we know the three names. You know, Rosa Parks sat down, Martin King stood up, whatever, and that was it. There was so much more going on about it. And it seems to me that a lot of those names have been lost to history and a lot of that activism. Well, in, in March, book one, book two, book three, we were trying to name so many other people so many unbelievable men and women, mm. black and white, gave everything they had. It was the three civil rights workers, Mika Scherner, and the Goodman White, James Shaney, African American. But you had a woman coming down from, from Detroit, Bola Luzo, to help out. The Reverend James Reed from Boston, white. And there were so many other people who homes were bombed. There were the bombing of churches, bombing of synagogues in the South. Rita Schwerner, the widow of Michael Schwerner, told me on the News Hour not long ago that she thinks that they wouldn't have gotten the attention for the three missing civil rights workers if they had all been black. And that, that Cheney alone would not have gotten the kind of attention. Do you, think, do you agree with that? Do you think oh, it no, took that? I, I, I agree with that, of why they were searching for the, the three young men, the three bodies, they discover other bodies. Mm. And we didn't hear about that necessarily. No. So tell me, as you've been on book tour, as you've been talking about this book and reliving this history, what kind of reactions do you get? How has it been received? Well, the book been well received, not just by children and young people, but by adults, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. Uh, I've had people come up and say, can I give you a hug? And I said, yes, I need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I felt the need yeah. to hug you today, yeah. too. It yeah. just yeah. happened, sir, by that. I, I, uh, sometimes people come up and they just, they, they're crying. Really? And said, my grandfather marched with you, my father, my teacher, my professor. And I think people want to know. And so we were someplace just a few days ago and a little boy with his parents got a copy of the book. And this little boy went straight to a table and started reading, reading, reading. Uh, Andrew told me about a call that he got from a um, well-known, uh, well, the paper's well-known and I shouldn't call the paper, but as a reporter for a very conservative newspaper. Mm. He passed the book on to his nine-year-old son. And then he called uh, my co-writer, Andrew, and said, uh, I don't usually do this, but I want to tell you. I passed uh, the book on to my nine-year-old son. And he went and put on his hat, uh, his Sunday suit, his best. Now he was marching around my house <laughs> saying I want equality for everybody. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. So, so kids are moved by. Um, several colleges and universities have adopted a book as a requirement for all freshman uh, students. Uh, I don't want necessarily to name the school, but one is Georgia State University, <laughs> and one is Michigan State, and the other one is Marquette. Mm -hmm. But you know, the interesting thing, conversation we keep having, um, is where we are now. 
with all of this. And the degree to which we, we had a big conversation in this room not long ago about, about, about the Supreme Court. We've had conversations all week here in Aspen about how we use language and whether we use language and what we're allowed to say and how we say it. And I wonder whether people are, wouldn't just be happier to be past it all, to say that's a nice history, let's blow out the candles on the birthday cake and move on. We, no, we, can, we, we cannot. It's not over. We're not there yet. We have not yet created the beloved community. We have not yet laid down the burden of race. When the Supreme Court made a decision gutting the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that I gave a little blood for on that bridge, I wanted to cry. I said to myself, these men never stood in unmovable lines. Their parents never did. Their grandparents never did. The three women on the court did the right thing, and one man did the right thing. I would love to take members of the United States Supreme Court back to Selma mm. and walk across that bridge. Mm. I would love to take them into the Dallas County Courthouse there. I would love to take them. You know, each year for the past 15 years, I've been taking members of Congress I know. back to Alabama, mm -hmm. back to parts of Mississippi. Recently, we took a group to the spot where Emmett Till was murdered. Wasn't Eric Cantor part of that group? It, it, like, Mr. Mm -hmm. Cantor? Or yeah, I don't know. Or? Maybe that wasn't a good luck thing for him. I don't well, know. I don't know. We all learn. We all grow. <laughs> and in the process, you know. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the process. But before I do, I want to let you all know that we're going to take your questions, because I know you have them. And I don't want to hog this. But I, I guess I, I, I struggle between the idea of optimism, the optimism that's contained in the retelling of your story and someone saying, I see something wrong, I'm just gonna to try to fix it, a young person. And a little bit of pessimism about where we are today, as much in denial as in uh, any idea that anything can, can change. People turn inward, people decide. Do you see evidence, as you talk to people, or as they talk to you, that some of that spirit that you possessed as a young person in this movement, or any movement today, still exists, oh, whether I, on the right or the left? Oh, I, I see it in people, especially the young. That sense of hope, that sense of optimism, it is in keeping with the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. I said to young people, and I said to some of my colleagues in the Congress, I said, you must never, ever give up. You must never, ever give in or get lost in a sea of despair. You must keep the faith and believe. When you lose hope, it's just like saying, oh. Isn't that what older people do? It's the younger people who have the optimism. Oh, I think we all have to, you know, I'm 74, but I'm as hopeful as the time I first took a seat on that lunch counter <laughs> stool. And I would not lose that. You know, since I've been, I got arrested 40 times during the 60s. That's all? Only 40. <laughs> but since I've been in Congress, five more times. Yeah. And I'm probably going to get arrested some more soon. <laughs> if we don't do something about comprehensive immigration reform, really? You have to have the ability to speak up, speak out, and get in the way, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. That's what I've been doing for more than 50 years, and I will continue to do it. You could have been a preacher. Yeah. Ne necessary trouble. That's not the way my dad saw it, by the way, who was a preacher. He saw all trouble is unnecessary. I would like, <laughs> off the point, I would love to take your questions. Um, I think that uh, John Lewis has a lot to give us, and if you'd like to dig right in. Right here. Hello. I'm wondering if you could say a few words about Bayard Rustin and whether you knew him or knew about his work. I, I knew Bayard Rustin. I worked with him. Uh, he was a scholar, organizer, smart, and he believed in drama. Uh, when, uh, we would be meeting from time to time, and people ask, John, what do you think, just during the sit-ins in Nashville, during the Freedom Ride, what should we do? I will always say, we need to find a way to dramatize the issue. Put a face on it, make it real, make it plain. Be arrested, abide, 
had that capacity and ability. If it hadn't been for him, I'm not so sure whether we would have had a successful march on Washington. No, the so-called big six get the credit, and Dr. King and others, but by was the organizer. And there were people that tried to move him out, put him in some corner. Because? Because he was gay. And people were afraid that, I won't call the senator's name, but they would stand up on the Senate floor while we were planning for the march. Even in the, in the so-called black leadership, there was two or three of the people that made up the big six uh, said no for by being the chairperson of the march. But three of us caucus and said we would select a Phil Randolph and the other two agreed and we knew Mr. Randolph would turn to by to be the person to put together. And that's exactly what happened. Now in this audience, I, I probably shouldn't say this. Uh, Which uh, means you should. Well, yeah, probably. By was good on detail. I'm talking very, very good in detail. But at one point during, uh, in planning the march on Washington, he wanted to know whether we had enough latrines. He said, we cannot have any disorganized pissing on the mall. <laughs> <laughs> So and he was right. He, he was, he was right. And, and so we had to get enough latrine. Now, during the march on Washington, you know, in the beginning, President Kennedy didn't like the idea of the march. But we met with him. But we came together, and the six of us invited uh, four major white religious and labor leaders to join us in issuing the, the call. When the march was all over, when Dr. King finished, Speaking, the march was all over. It was so peaceful, so pleasant, and other people call it other things. But President Kennedy invited each one of us back down to the White House. And he stood in the door of the Oval Office, beaming like a proud father, just beaming. He was so glad that everything had gone so well. And he kept saying, you did a good job, you did a good job. And when he got to Dr. King, he said, you did a good job, and you had a dream. It was my last time seeing President Kennedy. Can I ask you who else uh, to name? I, I'll go back to your questions in a second. Another unsung hero. There are so many voices that got lost in the retelling of the story. Well, you I'm know, always, always struck, for instance, that there were so few women on well, the we, stage. We didn't have a, we didn't have a major uh, woman. As a, well, you, you want me to be frank and candid? Please. Uh, you know, so many of the leaders in the civil rights movement with Baptist minister, it's not just anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And they treated the civil rights movement like it was a Baptist church. That, you know, it was not a place for women. And you had people like Dorothy Height, who was not a, a major speaker. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I think uh, the young lady from Arkansas, uh, Daisy Bates, said a few words. Mm -hmm. Mary Anderson was supposed to saying she got there late because of traffic. Right. My Hazel Jackson performed. Uh, but no one had a serious speaking no. role. You know, they call it in the church the stained glass ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> Where is I the, other, the microphone? Sure. And OK, right back here then. There's a microphone oh, coming to you. Um, one of the uh, unsung stories about the 60s was how the civil rights movement grappled uh, with the Vietnam War. Yeah. And um, that's something that I've devoted about eight years of my life. I just wrote a book called Selma to Saigon, The Civil Rights Movement in the Vietnam War. Which you happen to have right there. Yeah, right and uh, mm -hmm. no, it, it, I talk about uh, you and SNCC kind of grappling uh, with the issue of the war and the murder of Sammy Young. Yes. And uh, then later Julian Bond, the, the Georgia State Legislature's refusal to see, see Julian Bond. What do you think, do you think that the uh, Vietnam War really uh, divided the movement and people don't really know that much about it? Well, I, I think the Vietnam War had a major impact on the civil rights movement and divided some of the leadership. 
my organization during the time that I was a chair, the national chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, became the first major civil rights group to speak out against the war. I remember the statement that we issued in, in December uh, 1965, and we sort of reissued it again early part of 1966. And Julian Baum was supposed to be taking uh, the awful office as a member of the Georgia legislature. And uh, they refused to seat him because he supported the statement that we had made. And it was really respond to a young guy named Sammy Young, who was a student at uh, Tuskegee, had returned from the Navy, and he had been shot trying to use a so-called white restroom at a filling station. And you had all these young black and white men, volunteers in the movement, that were being drafted. And we issued that statement. And later, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th, 1967, made that great, unbelievable speech at Riverside Church. And I was there that night when priests and nuns and rabbis and ministers marched in when he made that to me, it was his greatest speech. When he condemned the war in Vietnam and the violence here at home. And some of the civil rights people, some of men of color and women of color, disagreed with him. And President Johnson sort of uh, cut off a relationship with him. April 4th, 1967, a year later, he was dead. That's right. Another question. Right behind you. Uh, Congressman, I wonder if you uh, would talk a little bit about the Civil Rights Division of Justice and your relationships with uh, John Doerr and Burke Marshall. Well, if, I tell you, I got to know John Doerr so well and Burke Marshall. I think people must understand that John Doerr was this unbelievable human being, grew up in Wisconsin, he was a, uh, I guess you might say, an Eisenhower Republican, but he stayed on during the Kennedy administration. And when we were beaten in Montgomery at the Greyhound bus station during the Freedom Ride by an angry mob on a Saturday morning, May 20th, in the night of May 21st, 1961, we were at the same church where I first met Dr. King and Reverend Ralph Abernathy. John Doerr didn't want the local authorities to interview us before the FBI and lawyer from the Department of Justice. If it hadn't been for John Doerr and Bert Marshall, some of us would not have survived. These two men, and especially John Doerr, Bert Marshall was in Washington, the assistant the attorney general in charge of the Civil Rights Division, but John Doerr was there in the courtroom, federal courtroom, in Montgomery during the Freedom Ride, during the march from Selma to Montgomery, when Mega Everett was assassinated and if the funeral took place in Jackson, it was John Doerr who saved the day. He stepped between police officials and a group of angry protesters. It could have been a race riot, a mob violence, if it hadn't been for John Doerr. These two men, two federal officials of the Department of Justice, the Civil Rights Division, gave so much. And they have never, ever received the credit that they should have received. If something was happening someplace in Jackson or America, Georgia, or in Birmingham, you can pick up the telephone and call Burt Marshall or John Doerr. And we did it so many times. Uh, thank you for being here, Congressman. And uh, I, I was recently in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, uh, and of course, President Lincoln, uh, in his famous address, spoke about the unfinished work uh, that those who fought there so nobly advanced. My question to you is, what do you see as the unfinished work of the Civil Rights Movement? Well, I think it's important that all of our children, all of our young people receive the best possible education. I think it's important that the Congress Pass comprehensive immigration reform. 
I, I, there's no such thing as an illegal human being. No, we all come from someplace. The movement was not just about African American, it was about all America, all human beings. And it doesn't matter whether we're black or white, Latino or Asian American, or Native American. It doesn't matter whether we're straight or gay. And some people ask me, why do you take such a strong stand on equality for the gay community? My answer has been very simple. I fought too long and too hard against discrimination based on race and color, not to be against discrimination based on sexual orientation. People ask me about marriage equality. And, and when people were asked Dr. King during the 50s about interracial marriage, he would answer and respond, and I agreed with him so much. Races don't fall in love and get married. Individuals fall in love and get married. So if two guys want to fall in love and get married, two women want to fall in love and get married, it's their business. And no government, state or federal, to tell people they can love or not love. Can I, can I pop in here? Because there is some debate uh, in, in what remains of the civil rights community, I suppose, that the word civil rights should, should be re reserved for the movement as we came to know it, and that gay rights isn't civil rights, that it's a different kind of battle. There is an argument about that. Where, where do you come down? I mean, well, why? Why, do, why would civil rights, why would gay rights be considered well, civil rights? My, my philosophy is very simple. You cannot have equality for some and not equality for all. You cannot draw the line and say, well, today I'm going to be, be for equality for minorities, but I'm not going to be for equality for someone else. We all are brothers and sisters. We all live in the same family. So there are We all live lines. in the same house. Mm. So you, you don't have lines and little hot pockets here and a little house and a little place here and there. Just in it all. Yes. Congressman. I feel uh, like I should come back over here later. I will, I promise. Um, Congressman, my question is, how, um, what was your greatest fear about what would happen after the assassination of Dr. King? What was, what was your greatest fear about what would happen to the movement? Well, when I heard that Dr. King had been shot, just, I thought he had just been wounded. I was in Indianapolis, Indiana with Bobby Kennedy campaigning for him, trying to put together a rally. And there was some debate of, about whether uh, Robert Kennedy should come and speak. And I was one of the people who said he must come and speak. And it was Robert Kennedy that announced to the crowd that Dr. King had been assassinated. And I didn't think so much about the future of the movement, but I, I thought that we had to continue to press on. Uh, I thought Dr. King would be around for many, many years, but he was taken from us. But for a moment, I had an executive session with myself. Uh, I said to myself, well, we still have Bobby. Hmm. And two months later, he was gone. But you had reason to despair after that. I remember 1968. I, I know I don't look that old, but I do. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking at the time that everything was going wrong, that yeah. everything was going off yeah. the rails. Well, I, I felt like America was just breaking apart. And I felt then, and I still feel to some degree now, that with the assassination of Dr. King and Robert Kennedy, something died in America. And those of us who lived through that, uh, we can we had to have the courage to pick up and go on. Mm. And I think Bobby Kennedy and Dr. King inspired me to get involved in American politics, mm. really. Okay, we're gonna to come to this side. Um, Eric? Congressman, uh, thank you for your example. Uh, I was born in 1968 and- I'm So young. Um, I <laughs> yep, so young. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm, I feel very much this, I'm also the son of immigrants, and so I feel very much this sense of 
generational obligation. I basically have done nothing. I won the lottery being born in this country when I was born. Uh, I didn't have to do any of the things that you've had to do. I didn't have to do any, make any of the choices that you had to make. Uh, and I, I want you to, I would like you to explain to people, not only my age, but to the young, young people uh, in the room, um, how it is that we should define this generation's challenges that we should be willing to put ourselves completely on the line for, uh, and how we in this age where it's not as stark as troopers standing on the bridge every day, how does this rising generation find and summon that same courage to stand up and fight the way that, um, that you did, Congressman? Well, I must tell you, uh, you're much better educated, you're better informed, you know, all this new technology. See, we didn't have a fax machine. We had one of these old mimograph machines, just turn and turn. You have an obligation, your generation, Young people have an obligation, a mission, and a mandate to push and pull and not be satisfied and do everything possible. I tell young people all the time, I spoke at seven college graduation this past season, and I said that the three young men that I met and got to know, they didn't die in Vietnam or the Middle East. Eastern Europe, or Central or South America, or in Africa. They died right here in our own country. And I hear too many people say, I'm not going to participate. That's not my cause. That's not. We have to participate. Politics control everything that we do in America, from the time that we're born into the time we die. So you have a moral obligation, a mission, and a mandate to get out there and push and do everything you can to leave this little piece of real estate we call America a little greener, a little cleaner, and a little more peaceful for generation yet unborn. Here's a question here. So quickly on that note, uh, do you think that would be better off staying out of office if we're interested in getting something done to the extent that Congress seems to have a hard time with that? Or no, I think, Excellent yeah, question. That's a good question. But I, I think we need more young people, more women, more minorities. But in office? To get out there, run for office, help other people get in, be brave, be courageous, be bold. But do you understand why someone like this young woman would say, Congress, really? Yeah, you can I change can lead it. other ways. Well, I think, and I'm gonna get in trouble here. Oh, good. But it's good trouble. It's necessary trouble. <laughs> See, I, I think that, that people today get involved, but they don't believe in the political arena. Right. I think there are people who wanna tear down rather than to build, and I think, along the way, and I've seen it all during the past few years. I've been in Congress 28 years, but long before then, I see people who love the world. They just love the whole world, but they don't like people. <laughs> they don't want to get their hands dirty. Okay. <laughs> so, so you're saying that people should run for office. You should run. But, but I guess... Go out there, go out there and be a headlight and lead the way. Do you feel like you've gotten more done in Congress than you did before you were elected to Congress? Well, Can everybody I, hear that question? Her follow-up was, do you think that you've gotten as much done in Congress as you did before you were elected? Well, sometime I, I, I feel like I've traveled this path before. And I can use some of the things that I discovered and learned during my involvement in the Civil Rights Movement that said to my brothers and sisters in the Congress, and, and I call them brothers, and they may be on another side of the issue, but I walk up and I say, brother, you don't really mean that. You can do better than that. Your mama didn't teach you that. <laughs> And I wonder if that works. 
I'm the try, guilt, the guilt thing. It. You try it. I tried it. Listen, I, we could have more questions and we could talk to you all afternoon, but there are books to be bought and signed. And uh, you have an opportunity to get a book signed by a Medal of Freedom winner who is going to tell his story in three parts. The first part is March, book one, by the wonderful and honorable John Robert Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.